Welcome to the catalysis part of the R Plus Industry Day. What I want to give you now is a brief flavor about the opportunities that plasmonics and nanophotonics approaches have in order to make chemical reactions more efficient. Our basic premise is that we need to find a way to move from the high pressure, high temperature requirement of conducting chemical reactions to a more nature inspired way. We all know that in photosynthesis, for example, nature has found a way to catalyze one of the key chemical reactions in enabling life with the use of sunlight and at ambient conditions. Can nanoscience help us to achieve the same? The key requirements are A, we need to use sunlight as the underlying energy source and this will require that we fundamentally alter the reaction pathways of chemical reactions in order to reduce the energy requirement. With traditional photocatalysts such as TiO2, we have a problem because there, of course, the band gap is in the UV and we only are able to harvest a very small amount of the solar spectrum. I will now show how with plasmonics we can drastically broaden the bandwidth over which we can achieve light harvesting using nanoscience approaches where we switch from semiconductors to metals. And secondly, we need to generate a nanoscale reactor environment in which we integrate light harvesting nanostructures and defect based reaction centers in order to efficiently reduce the energy barriers for chemical reactions and achieve hence a low energy requirement in photocatalysis. I have one overview slide here where I want to quickly show you the basic science behind this. So basically a, metal, a metallic nanoparticle is a very efficient collector of sunlight energy below the band gap. And if I then combine it with molecules, I'm able to harvest this energy. Basically the sunlight sets the electron cloud in the metal nanoparticle into motion into a form that's called a plasmon. And when this plasmon decays, as we see here now, it generates very energetic electron hole pairs. And these electron hole pairs can then enter adjacent molecules. For example, if the electron enters into this molecule here, it can go into the LUMO level and it can lead to extra energy of that molecule, which will then reduce the energy requirement of a chemical reaction. And the key point here is that this energy harvesting works at ambient condition and it works over the broad spectrum of the sunlight because the metal nanoparticle can harvest energy over a very broad spectral range that I can tune by the size and the shape of this metal nanoparticle. As I have this way imbued the molecule with an extra amount of energy, I can then use this energy to lower the activation barrier of a chemical reaction. So the main idea shown in this animation here now is that whereas conventionally I might have quite a large energetic barriers and need large temperatures to catalyze a chemical reaction, thanks to the plasmonic hot electrons, I alter the energy landscape due to the extra energy that my molecule gets via the hot electron in order to reduce the thermal activation barrier and hence reduce the energy requirement for the chemical reaction to occur. Within R+, we study the fundamentals of this approach. And for example, I'm just highlighting here two studies. We can talk about this more in the live section in the moment. In a first study here, we have shown in a combination of bulk electrochemistry and plasmon excitation of single nanoparticles, how we can reduce the energy requirements for an oxidation reaction. We have particularly shown that hot holes can contribute to reduce the voltage requirement for the generation, in this case, of a polymer shell around a thin metallic nanoparticle. This provides us with an avenue to estimate the energy of the hot carriers employed. In a second study, we use a traditional photocatalyst, TiO2, but we enhance its light harvesting capabilities over a more broad spectral range via in a controlled way, introducing oxygen vacancy centers, and we then use nanophotonic approaches in order to make such a nanostructure TiO2 into an efficient sunlight collector. We have in this study demonstrated the photocatalytic ability via the reduction of silver salt into silver particle on such a nanostructure. Now I'm saying nanostructure. Up to now, most of the studies deal with simple structures, with simple and single structures. Of course, any sort of benchmarking and real application necessitates studies on large area substrates. So 
finding ways of efficient large area fabrication of optimized nanostructures for energy harvesting from sunlight and for carrier injections into molecule is key. So I welcome you to take this quick introduction as a starting point for some stimulating discussions this afternoon. So welcome everyone to this Reactive Plasmonics Industry event. My name is Wayne Dixon from King's College London and today I'd like to talk about scalable and reactive nanophotonic nanostructures for catalytic applications. So as perhaps you've already heard, plasmonics opens up new catalytic routes at lower temperatures thanks to the high energy of the carriers which are available upon plasmonic decay. They enable more of the solar spectrum to be harvested in contrast with some traditional photocatalysts, for example, titanium dioxide, which really only harvests the blue portion of the spectrum, as indicated here on the right hand side of this figure, leaving most of the solar spectrum unabsorbed and therefore unused. Plasmonic materials can also be hybridized with traditional catalysts, which can lower the energy of these reactions and improve efficiency. We can adapt the technology to non-precious metals and novel materials and that's what I'd really like to discuss today in some of my examples. So the global challenges I'd like to discuss are both water pollution and CO2 reduction. So these urgently require scalable solutions to have the impact that's required. So catalytic processes therefore require scalable material technologies and this can be provided for either by self-assembled fabrication routes or colloidal chemical synthesis and both of these techniques can allow the materials to be designed for particular spectral windows allowing us to control the energy of the hot carriers. So the two classes of materials I'd like to discuss today are the self-assembled plasmonic metamaterials as shown on the left hand side. So we can see these are typical laboratory samples and they're around one centimeter squared in surface area. On the right hand side, we can see an example of a colloidal plasmonic nanoparticle, which is comprised of a silicon dioxide core decorated with both gold and platinum on the outside. And this is the material I'd like to discuss first with particular application to water purification via the degradation of methylene blue as an example process. So methylene blue is used as both a dye and a fungal inhibitor and is a well-known pollutant. So the catalyst in question, as I mentioned, was made from silicon dioxide nanoparticles decorated with gold and platinum and using therefore the minimum quantity of precious metals. The small size of the particles on the surface of the silicon dioxide core also allows us to increase the efficiency of hot carrier extraction. So we can see in these electron microscopy images quite clearly the silicon and oxygen in the core and the gold and platinum decorating the surface of the particle. We can also see upon white light illumination, as shown in the figure on the left hand side, that with the correct amount of platinum on the surface, up to 90% of the methylene blue can be degraded. If we compare the performance of this catalyst with literature, we see that it's already state of the art. So a very successful demonstration of photocatalytic degradation. The second example I would like to discuss is reactive electrochemical electron tunnel junctions. So this is a really unique device and is based on these self-assembled plasmonic metamaterials comprised of gold nanocylinders. So these materials, as I have already mentioned, are self-assembled and scalable, but despite that, they allow nanoscale geometrical control of the optical properties of the material. They can be produced in a wide range of architectures, so not only nanocylinders, but also nanocones and nanotubes, allowing us to control carrier extraction and field enhancement. They have a conductive substrate, which is transparent, so they can be addressed either optically or electrically, or indeed both, as I will show in my first example. So here we can see a three-dimensional architecture. The separation between these nanoparticles is typically less than 100 nanometers, and the diameter of the nanoparticles themselves is typically around 30 to 40 nanometers, with lengths of around 200 nanometers. And this provides around a seven-fold increase in surface area compared to a planar substrate. We can see the architecture even more clearly in this SEM image, which is a tilted view, also showing an exposed cross-section, allowing us to identify the goals in the array. So in the first embodiment of this, I would like to discuss, it's a really unique architecture. So we can see that in the schematic on the left-hand side, where we have applied a eutectic gallium indium electrode to the top surface of this template, which is holding our nanoparticles. 
This allows us to controllably utilize the nanometric size gap at the top of the nanoparticles. So if we apply a current to this material, electrons will tunnel inelastically, excite a plasmon in the nanoparticles, which then can radiate. So we can, in other words, monitor this electron tunneling process optically. So to test the performance of this device electrochemically, simply because we have such a high density of hot carriers and these tunneling gaps, we applied the molecule polyl histidine, which can be induced to undergo oxidation or reduction depending on its gaseous environment. And we wanted to monitor this process and control this process with the hot carriers. <laughs> So here we can see in this curve how we can induce the polyl histidine to oxidize and reduce depending on whether we provide oxygen or hydrogen in the system. So the intensity of the light emitted from the plasmon decay can vary by up to one order of magnitude depending on the state of the polyl histidine in the junction. Unfortunately, I cannot provide any benchmarks for this process as this device is simply unique. So the final example I would like to discuss is the reduction of carbon dioxide using scalable copper metamaterials. So copper is a good plasmonic metal in the visible spectral range with similar properties to gold. It's also a well-known catalyst for CO2 reduction, which exhibits high CO2 absorption, but of course is much less expensive than the traditional plasmonic metals. It benefits from facile electrochemical deposition, so it's fully compatible with template-based self-assembled fabrication approaches, providing a scalable fabrication route for these materials. So here we can see a typical laboratory sample, which is already one centimeter by one centimeter squared. Of course, we could readily scale this material in size. We have precise control of the nanoscale architecture, and of course, this provides a large reactive surface area, as we can see in this SEM image. And the resonances or the light absorption in this material is easily controllable throughout the visible part of the spectrum by tuning the nanoscale geometry of the material. The reduction of CO2 can, of course, produce valuable products. For example, syngas, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, right the way through to multi-carbon products such as ethylene and methanol, and indeed many more. Thanks to the conductive substrate on these materials, they can be employed as photoelectrochemical electrodes. We have already observed a strong photocurrent response in these materials, even when they're unoptimized, i.e. they're illuminated off resonance. And indeed, we wish to characterize these and benchmark these materials against the traditional plasmonic metals. So on the right hand side, we can see the performance of some of the traditional plasmonic metals, including gold and silver, both in the light and dark state. And here, importantly, they're also compared to the rate of carbon dioxide uptake from trees. And we can see that all these plasmonic materials can outperform trees, which are often touted as one of the major potential solutions to removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for their kind attention.